Hi everyone, David Fusino here, and in this screencast for Anthropology and World Problems being offered at Commonwealth University of Pennsylvania, we're going to take a look at global health. So some of the big questions to think about is what do we mean when we're talking about health? Who has the power to determine that health, disease, illness, and how should global health issues be addressed? We will certainly talk about the COVID-19 pandemic uh, and I will situate this in the context of other um, diseases that have plagued uh, humanity for uh, some time, including infectious diseases historically. Also be looking at contemporary facts and figures about HIV AIDS and malaria. We'll take a look at medical anthropology's contributions and just briefly highlight a couple of ethnographic examples of work that anthropologists have done to consider health. So the COVID-19 pandemic, as of August 9th, 2022, this is from Worldometers, and it, it they collect their data in a particular way. If you look at World Health Organization, they collect their data in a particular way in the CDC as well. One of the things that you'll note, not only in looking at COVID-19, but looking at other facts and figures, it's very hard to get absolute numbers in terms of what's happening. So you'll see in a lot of the World Health Organization reports that we're going to go through in this screencast, a, a variance or a range within which things are possibly located and a best guess uh, estimate in terms of where they're at. So globally, 591 plus million cases. 6.4 million deaths, and still we have today 21 million active cases. The United States is the number one country worldwide in terms of total cases. Uh, there's you know lots of discussion about why that might be. Uh, one of the discussion points would be the number of tests that have been done in the United States, um, and also the number of facilities overall. Uh, other um, things, you know, I mean, we've all at this point lived through the COVID-19 pandemic and seen a variety of different social, cultural responses to that. Where we've seen the economic fallout, uh, we've seen um, lots of politics uh, around appropriate measures to curb uh, the pandemic or even recognizing uh, that it is in fact a, a pandemic. Um, Anyway, the uh, total case in the United States, 94 million. New cases um, by day, 76,000 um, as of August 9th. Um, total deaths in the United States, over 1 million. Um, and new deaths, again, by day, 439 people. India, 44 million cases, 16,000 new cases, 526,000 total deaths, and 54 people uh, died. Uh, yesterday, as of this recording, from the COVID-19 pandemic. In France, 34 million and 38,000 new cases, 152,000 deaths and 111 new deaths. Um, you can see a real jump here between France and Brazil with 680,000 um, deaths total. Um, and um, but look at the numbers in relation to the United States in terms of total cases. So a greater proportion of individuals here um, in terms of that that are that are dying uh, from COVID-19. And you know, World Worldometer updates their dashboards on a daily basis, so you can go there and check out what the latest facts and figures are at your leisure. Um, one of the issues, of course, in curbing uh, curbing the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and flattening the curve uh, has been to vaccinate population. Um, we've also seen utilization of personal protective equipment, uh, and you know, just you know, as the pandemic is uh, going. Uh, into multiple years in many countries, uh, I, I think it's important to keep in mind globally that it is in a lot of different places in a lot of different countries. Uh, for example, 
um, just in the past six weeks as of this recording, so in the beginning of July, there were no cases in the Federated States of Micronesia, and that has since changed fairly dramatically for the island states of Ponape and Koshrai. Um, globally, there have been uh, 12 billion uh, vaccine doses. Look at that, that's, that's pretty good. You know, if we look at these, these larger numbers, uh, of course, this considers the two doses, the booster, uh, potentially an additional booster uh, as well. Um, and that's from World Health Organization as of August 1st, 2022. World Health Organization also has a campaign right now uh, around vaccine equity. So in 2021, the World Health Organization set the target for 70% global vaccination coverage by mid-2022. As of July 2022, only 58 of World Health Organization's 195 four member states had reached the target 70%, and only in low-income countries, just 37% of healthcare workers uh, had received a complete course of primary vaccination. So these are frontline healthcare workers, uh, just over a third in low-income um, countries. Despite incremental success since the COVID-19 Vaccine Delivery Partnership, which is a collective international effort launched in January 2022, low- and middle-income countries are facing difficulties uh, to get a step, uh, to get a, a change uh, in the vaccination rates. Um, this represents a serious threat to uh, the fragile economic recovery, including uh, due to the risk of new variants creating large waves of serious disease and death in populations with low vaccination coverage. It also means accelerating the delivery of other COVID-19 tools and treatments is a crucial priority to help the world build up multiple layers of protection against the virus. Concerted in action, uh, or an urgent action is needed for many countries, international partners and agencies. The G20 finance ministers is required to increase vaccination levels and expedite access. So again, this is an international approach to the COVID-19 pandemic by the uh, World Health Organization in unison with uh, many uh, agencies, multilaterals, uh, and states as well. So situated the COVID-19 pandemic in the context of um, infectious diseases, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Jared Diamond's work here, Guns, Germs, and Steel, and basically the thesis or the upshot of his work is that um, when the Europeans or settler societies arrived to indigenous populations throughout the globe, but particularly in the Americas, we noted a really quick decimation of native uh, populations. Indigenous peoples, um, some estimates are, are up to 90% of the population uh, was uh, killed by infectious diseases. And this had to do with the burden of disease uh, in the so-called new world versus the old world. Uh, the old world, uh, supposedly the Europeans uh, voyaging over, living in close proximity with animals, having a lot of the zoonotic diseases. Uh, and so you see bubonic plague, uh, which we'll talk about, uh, cholera, influenza, malaria, measles, scarlet fever, sleeping sickness, smallpox, and TB, um, well-noted um, killers amongst Native American populations within the United States. Uh, but of course, the sad history in the U.S. too around uh, things like the smallpox blankets and deliberate infections, essentially um, biological warfare, uh, new world syphilis, yaws, and yellow fever. Um, so one of the things to keep in mind as we're uh, already in multiple years of the COVID-19 pandemic is that if we're looking at uh, global pandemics, you know, how have they played out and how... Um, you know, what have been the societal responses to those and the cultural responses and, and how long did they last? Uh, and of course, um, as, as things are accelerating and moving in the, uh, in the context of globalization in terms of media, uh, in terms of things like travel, the whole discussion about revenge travel in 2021, coming back with a vengeance, uh, what we have to keep in mind is that um, you know, this is, uh, this is alive, uh, it changes, it evolves. Uh, and the bubonic plague, uh, as a contrast or example here, has existed for thousands of years. In the five-year outbreak in Europe uh, before, in, between 1347 and 1352, uh, some will say it's four years, about 25 million people in Europe um, had died uh, before it left Europe. 
uh, Black Death killed perhaps a third of the global population. There were multiple flare-ups in uh, Florence, for example, in what is today Italy, uh, and you know this this you know would abate for a year or some months, and then it would come back, and it wouldn't be so bad one year, and it would come back with a vengeance the next year. So uh, the dramatic, really shifts in economics that occurred with the bubonic plague, whole areas of the countryside were depopulated. Basically, feudal agriculture collapsed in, in many areas. This was a disease of rodents. Uh, fleas carried the infection from rats to humans and then from human to human in terms of the transmission. Uh, smallpox, uh, we mentioned, I mentioned this before, um, human to human with intense spreading in the New World with the arrival of Columbus, um, Jared Diamond's gun germs and steel, talking about Cortez attacking the Aztec capital in Mexico as a particular example. Um, so in comparative context, what's going on today? Well, we still have malaria. Um, this is transmitted through bites of a particular mosquito. The intensity of the transmission depends on a number of factors related to the parasite, the vector, the human host, and the environment. The symptoms appear seven days or more, usually 10 to 15 after the infected mosquito bite. The first symptoms include fever, headache, chills, and vomiting. And, you know, if you think about these, these might be difficult to recognize as malaria because they could be a number of different things. Uh, if not treated within 24 hours, it can progress to severe illness and often death. Um, nearly half the world's population was at risk of malaria in 2020. Some population groups are considerably higher risk of contracting malaria and developing severe disease. These include infants, children under the age of five, pregnant women and parents with HIV AIDS. People with low immunity moving to areas with intense malaria transmission, such as migrant workers, mobile population, and travelers. Um, globally, uh, the cases of malaria, 241 million in 2020, compared to 227 million cases in 2019. Estimated deaths from malaria in 2020, 627,000. This is an increase of 69,000 deaths over the previous year. The World Health Organization, who's tracking data on this, uh, noted that about two-thirds of these deaths, or 47,000, were due to disruptions caused during the COVID-19 pandemic. The remaining one-third of the deaths, or 22,000, reflect a recent change in World Health Organization's methodology for calculating malaria mortality, irrespective of the COVID-19 disruptions. The new cause of death methodology was applied to 32 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that shoulder about 93% of all malaria globally uh, and, and all malaria deaths. Applying the methodology real that um, malaria has taken a considerable toll on African children every year since 2000 uh, than previously thought. And so this is, a, this is an issue of measurement. And if we're talking about large numbers and how those numbers are captured, it's difficult to ascertain what those are. And as the methodology changes, uh, we realize that um, the old measures of things might uh, not quite be accurate. Uh, but the overall picture is, I think, pretty clear here. The World Health Organization Africa region continues to carry a disproportionately high share of the global malaria burden. In 2020, the Africa region was home to 95% of all malaria cases and 96% of all deaths. Children under the age of five accounted for about 80% of the malaria deaths in the region. Four African countries just represent over just half of the malaria deaths worldwide. Nigeria, 31.9, Democratic Republic of Congo, 13.2, um, United Republic of Tanzania, 4.1, and Mozambique. 3.8 percent. HIV, key facts. Uh, this comes um, from World Health Organization as well, 2022. 40.1 40 million deaths globally from HIV for all time. 38.4 people living uh, with HIV at the end of 2021. Um, two-thirds of whom, or 25.6 million, are in the World Health Organization Africa region. In 2021, 650,000 people died from HIV-related causes. You can see the range there. And 1.5 million acquired HIV. The worst case scenario is 7.7 .7 million HIV-related deaths over the next 10 years, uh, increasing HIV infections due to HIV service disruptions during COVID-19 and slowing 
public health response to HIV.